Good morning, Berwyn United Methodist Church. I am Veronica. I am here to do the reading of peace for the second Sunday of Advent. We will wait for you to come, Lord, and set things right. In this world where a few of us are wealthy, many are poor. While a few are powerful, many are oppressed. But your justice is good news to those who are held down. When you arrive, the world will be set right. There will be enough for everyone, and everyone will receive a fair share. There will be peace on earth and an end to oppression. We will trade our dark clothes of mourning for bright garments of praise. Just as healthy plants spring up from good seeds, righteousness will spring up from all the nations. This is good news. Come, Lord Jesus, and bring your justice. Restore us, God of life. Bring us closer to peace, the peace that lights the way on the journey to Bethlehem. During this season of waiting, may we be open to signs of your everlasting peace. As we light the second Advent candle, let us pray for expressions of God's grace and compassion in the midst of brokenness and despair. May the joyful promise of your presence, O oh God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our virtual worship service at Berwyn United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Rodney Brailsford and I'm glad to worship with you this morning as we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent. Friends, the Advent season is a very special time of year as we await the long anticipated birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To celebrate this time of year, in addition to our regular scheduled worship services, we have some exciting events going on at the church that I hope you'll attend. Soupy Thursday began last Thursday and will continue weekly throughout the winter months. It's held at the church from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in Schick Hall, and this year it's open for both dine-in and takeout. To find out the weekly soup menu, check out our Instagram page that week. We hope to see you there to enjoy some delicious soup and time for fellowship with one another or just to grab some soup and take home and enjoy. We'll also be hosting Carols and Coco on Thursday, December 16th at 6 p.m. in Schick Hall. This will be a festive and exciting event for everyone to feel free to bring friends and family as it should be a great time for all ages. We'll be hosting the Parson Brown Singer as a local group of professional Christmas carolers and enjoying cocoa and cookies. Lastly, I'm excited to announce that we'll be holding our annual Lessons and Carol service on December 19th at 9.30 a.m. in place of our traditional worship service. This is a much-loved tradition here at Berwyn United Methodist Church and is always a beautiful and joyous celebration of scripture and hymns and celebration of the season. Following Lessons and Carols, we'll have our Christmas brunch also on December 19th in Schick Hall. Again, I hope to see as many of you as possible there as we have one final opportunity to fellowship together in 2021. The Advent season is a truly special time of anticipation and gathering, but it can also be a busy and stressful one as it seems there's always so much to prepare. Let us not forget to take time to appreciate this special time and be grateful for one another. It's my hope that we'll use these events as opportunities to take a moment away from our usual preparations and find time to fellowship with one another and give thanks to God for the beauty that is the Advent season. Would you please, friends, join me in a prayer. Blessed is the Lord, and blessed are God's people to whom God sends a Savior, the Messiah, who is Christ the Lord. Blessed is our God, and blessed are God's gifts that grace us with forgiveness and every good gift. Lord, you have come to dwell with us, and so we ask that you build your temple within our hearts. In the name of Jesus, the living Christ, we pray. Amen.
Friends, would you please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, where John the Baptist prepares the way of Jesus. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Echeria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all people, will see God's salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Repent, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Valleys shall be filled, mountains and hills shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth. By themselves, these words have no meaning. They need context. That's true for any word. We might be able to define a word, but it really has no meaning until we understand the context in which it is spoken. I think that's why Luke is so specific in today's gospel. He sets the coming of God's word in a specific context, naming a time, people, and places. It was the 15th year of Tiberius' reign and as emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod was ruler of Galilee. Philip was ruler of Etruria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler of Abilene. It was during the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas. That's when and where God's word came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. That's the context for John going into the region around the Jordan and speaking God's word. The echoes of John's voice can still be heard. They're everywhere. That word he spoke at the Jordan River continues to be spoken in all times and all places, but it needs context. So I'm going to follow Luke's lead on this. I want to set the coming of God's word to us in a particular time, place, and circumstance. This is not the sermon I wanted to preach today, but given the reality of the world we are living in, it's the sermon I felt I had to preach today. So here we go. As of December 1st, there have been at least 510 homicides in Philadelphia, making 2021 the deadliest year on record since 1990. A man shot in the head and chest while sitting in his car was able to run to his friend's house for safety, but ultimately died of his wounds Tuesday night in North Philadelphia. A 36-year-old man was struck after a gunman fired at least 10 shots from across the street on Lambert Street at around 11.30 p.m. that night. The victim had been sitting in the driver's seat of his car and was able to get out and run about 50 feet to a house belonging to some friends where he collapsed on the living room floor. And once again, the word of God came to God's people, repent, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, valleys shall be filled, mountains and hills shall be made low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth. What does that mean in the context of 510 homicides in Philadelphia? What would repentance look like? They aren't hard questions. It's not too difficult to understand what today's gospel might mean. At a minimum, the very least it can mean is stop it. Just stop it. For the life of the world, stop it. That's not the full extent of repentance, but it's a good starting place. I think we want to stop. I hope we do. I want it to stop, and I'm sure you do too. I believe that's what God wants us to do. I just don't know if we will. I don't know if we will repent this time. What I do know is this. In the wake of the last shooting, politicians will argue and debate, plead and blame. Gun control advocates will advocate. 
Second Amendment defenders will defend. People will gather for vigils and moments of silence. Thoughts and prayers will be offered. Some will point out the need for more and better mental health care. People will shake their heads and lament that this happened yet again. Police officers will be thanked and praised. People will post their opinions on social media and preachers will preach. The dead will be buried, the wounded will be treated, and the sorrowful will cry. There's nothing new about any of that. A lot of that was the response to the previous 509 homicides in Philadelphia and the coming of God's word in that city. And it's already begun again following the 510th. I'm not saying those things are wrong or that they shouldn't be done, but let's not kid ourselves. That is not repentance. It's just not. Those things do not prepare the way, fill the valleys, lower the mountains and hills, straighten the crooked, or smooth the rough. They change nothing. Meanwhile, you and I wait and watch, wondering when, where, and who will be number 511th. The repentance John proclaims on God's behalf, then and now, demands a change of heart, a change of mind, a change in how we speak, and a change in how we act. It demands a change in our life's direction, a change in our country's direction, and a change in our priorities and values. This change, this repentance, is not a one-time event. It's a process we live into. It must become our daily practice, a way of being, a way of living and relating. So what does repentance look like for you considering the 510 Philadelphia homicides? What will you change about yourself and your life? What will you do differently? How will it affect your choices, values, and priorities? Will your response help prepare the way of the Lord? Now, right now, you might be thinking to yourself, what did I do? I wasn't there. I didn't plan the homicides. I didn't pull the trigger. And you're right. We were not there. We were not the killers. The prophetic call for repentance, however, is not limited to the guilty. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel explained it well when he said this. The prophets remind us of the moral state of a people. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. All, you and I included. We are responsible to God, to each other, and to the world. This is about number 510 and our responsibility to the dead, wounded, and grieving of Philadelphia. And it's about so much more. Don't you see what's happening to us? Humanity is bleeding out and the soul of the world is hemorrhaging. We've been given a sacred trust and we have a responsibility. To deny our responsibility is to refuse to repent. There can be no repentance without taking a responsibility. John's voice will not be silenced. God's word remains, repent, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, valleys shall be filled, mountains and hills shall be made low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth. So what do you think? Can we do it differently this time? I think we can. Christ has shown us a different way, a different life. I believe we have been given what it takes. Isn't that the hope of Advent and the promise of Christmas? Isn't that really what the Advent Christmas cycle is about? Preparing for and giving birth to Christ in our time, in our place, in our circumstances. That's repentance. Taking responsibility. Yes, by God's grace, we can do it differently this time. But will we? Will we do it differently this time? That's a different question. That's the harder question, and the answer remains to be seen. If you want to know the answer to that question, don't look to our politicians, police, or military. Don't give yourself to popular opinions or the loudest voices. Don't blame the ghettos or poverty. Look within yourself. The answer lies within each of us. Whether we do it differently this time is a question only you and I can answer. And each one of us answers that question every day of our lives. So my question for you today is, What's your answer? Let us pray. Loving God, in this season suspended between hope and fulfillment, let us never forget what you have done. May we be overwhelmed by your mercy, which flows in wave after wave. May we be honest about the darkness within us and perceptive of the light around us. May we make straight the path for the Lord, that together we may see God's glory revealed. Lord, darkness has surrounded us until your light burst into our lives like a clear, bright dawn. 
We cover our eyes. We're so unprepared for your coming. Your light blazes forth like fire, consuming all that it touches. How can we stand before you, Lord? The road that we thought was straight and wide is now exposed as twisted, crooked, blocked by a mountain of sin. Where can we turn? Who will guide us back to the way of peace? The way that leads to you. As we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may your love overflow, rich and wholesome in the world. May you be found pure and blameless, having prepared a way and a place in your heart for those who suffer. May you reap the bountiful harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of our God. Amen. Go in peace.